Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And um, the, the thought of this Sunday school uh, hour um, during this coronavirus containment um, was thought of um, prior to last week. And, and again, Dr. Drake said, we really need to have something that fosters community and we need to cover the subject of community. So um, you had a, a lesson last week, uh, I believe, uh, on the resurrection, uh, but today we're starting something new and it's going to be shared by all three ministers and it's on the, the subject of community. Um, now, that, that's an interesting subject in the, in the historical setting uh, that, that we're in. You know, I, I just had my 50th birthday in December, and I have never uh, experienced anything like this in my life. Uh, I have always been able to uh, get on my bicycle or get in the car and go someplace that I wanted to go, and it really didn't matter who was there or how close they stood by me or what they handed me and whether they had a mask on or not, or whether they were wearing gloves or not. Um, this, obviously, this situation has completely changed our lives. But I will say that uh, it's not the first time in history that all of this has happened. In fact, um, someone had shared a, a photo from um, a, newspaper, and I'm not sure what newspaper this comes from, nor uh, do I know, uh, well, this is um, the Corporation of the City of Kelowna, um, K-E-L-O-W-N-A. I'm not sure where that is. Um, Kelowna, B.C., so this is uh, obviously in British Columbia, so this is in Canada. And this is a public notice taken from November the 7th, 1918. And it says, uh, public notice. Notice is hereby given that in order to prevent the spread of Spanish influenza, all schools, public and private, churches, theaters, movie, movie picture halls, pool rooms, and other places of amusement and lodge meetings are to be closed until further notice. All public gatherings consisting of 10 or more are prohibited. Uh, this comes from Donald uh, D.W. Sutherland, who's the mayor of this town in British Columbia. So all that is just to say that this has happened in history before. Um, and um, it, it, it takes some adjustment. This last week, just in, in visiting with my children, uh, my youngest, Grace, uh, she feels very uh, jilted um, because she can't be at school with her friends. She can't be uh, around her classmates. She can't study in a traditional setting. And so all of this it has disrupted her life. And um, she's just one example of many. Um, my middle son, Noah, who is working for Meadowood, uh, we were sitting at the kitchen table and I could tell that he was a little bit down and I said, uh, uh, what's going on? And uh, he said, it's just boring. He said, it's almost like uh, we look forward to the weekday so that we have a little bit more variety of what to do. Uh, so the weekends are especially boring. Um, so, but I think with anything, it's, it's what you make out of it. But it, it, is, uh, it has forced us to do different things, and it's forced us to value what we had a month and a half ago. Now, so there uh, bears witness to uh, the valuable subject of community, and uh, especially Christian community. You know, as the old saying goes, you don't know what you what you got till it's gone. And and we have been the, the church as far as a physical structure and being physically together with one another has been taken from us. But there are some silver linings to this cloud. 
And uh, I would like for you to consider the following discussion questions. We won't have this discussion right now, but after my presentation, we'll have this discussion. And I want you to consider the following uh, questions. Maybe you want to jot them down or just think of them in your head. Think of how you would answer. But this is going to uh, fuel our discussion, say, in maybe 20 minutes or so. But consider the following questions when you think of community. Um, number one, what have you missed the most? Having been contained over the last month, um, month and a half, since this all began, and I've really lost track of, of when this actually began. Do you remember, Jeff? Mid-March. Mid-March. So we're, we're supposedly five weeks into it. We're five weeks into this time of containment. What have you missed the most about your life six weeks ago? That's one thing. What have you missed the most? Secondly, what has been good about the last five weeks? What, what, what's been good about this new way of life? Anything? I can, say, I can think of some things that have been very healthy, very good uh, uh, with this new lifestyle. Number three, what do you think God is trying to teach us? As I said in my last devotional over uh, Psalm 145, verse 3, that his understanding is, un is unsearchable. Um, God is up to something, and his wisdom is, is, is perfect. He says in the book of Isaiah, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. And so what do you think God is trying to teach us? He certainly has our attention. Tony Evans, who's a very popular pastor, maybe you've heard him. He uh, ministers in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He says God has gotten the attention of many people during this time of containment. And, and I do believe that he's up to something. Um, we're making plans on putting a, a new banner outside on our, the church's front lawn so that when people do drive by, that they're given an impression, that they're given a thought that would direct them to the Lord and uh, to consider spiritual things in their life. And then lastly, what are people learning about themselves and about others? What are people learning about themselves or about others? So those are some discussion questions that I want us to uh, to engage in uh, maybe in 20 minutes or so. What have you missed the most? What has been good about the containment? What do you think God is trying to teach us? And what are people learning about themselves and others? Well, uh, when we consider the um, subject of Christian community, I like this um, definition of community, which comes from uh, the Oxford uh, Dictionary of the English Language. Uh, let me pull that up for myself here. Community can be defined uh, in, in two ways. It's a noun, of course. Community can be confined as a group of people living in the same place or having a particular characteristic in common. Uh, so that's your nuts and bolts definition. Uh, like the scientific community or the uh, religious community or the um, Hispanic community. But then there's another definition, which is a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. A feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes interests, and goals. And that just strikes me as a good definition of church. Um, uh, of course, that definition is going to leave some things out when we think about the church. It is not a theological definition. It's not a biblical definition, but it does hit the mark of how church functions, that it's a group of like-minded people that love each other, that care for each other, that serve one another. And in the weeks to come, we're going to be getting into those scriptures that talk about um, what we do for one another. And even in today's presentation, we're going to cover a few of those. 
But when we think about community, um, probably uh, the person that invested uh, a good portion of the last few years of his life was a man by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And hopefully you can see the slide up on the screen. If you can see the slide, maybe you can nod. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, um, he was a, a German pastor and theologian. Uh, I would assume that he was trained in Germany um, and he came to America and he was a professor at Union Theological Seminary in New York. And uh, he had a good life. He had a wife, he had children, um, but it came to, um, to a point in his life where he felt like, well, I can't say, I'm not sure if he had a wife and children. I, I, so I, I back up on that, but he, he had a good life. He was um, uh, well provided for, he uh, internationally educated, uh, came to this country, uh, taught in, a, in an American seminary, and he kind of had life by the tail, as uh, some might uh, say. But then uh, World War II broke out in 1939, and um, he was a, a, a German native that did not like the thought and the behavior of Adolf Hitler. And so he felt called to go back to Germany and to uh, be a part of the resistance movement. Um, and he felt it was his calling uh, to try to put an end to Adolf Hitler's uh, Nazi regime. So, um, but he died in 1945 in, in those efforts. He was uh, put, he was jailed and imprisoned for resisting the government. And then he was taken to a concentration camp. And then uh, he eventually was hung. Um, and he was hung, uh, he, he was just 39 years old when he was executed. And, uh, and yet his influence was great on uh, the modern day Christian faith. Um, maybe you've heard a few of his uh, publications, uh, The Cost of Discipleship or Life Together, or um, uh, there was uh, in the last uh, few years, there was a biography written by Eric Metaxas um, on the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, so, uh, Bonhoeffer has a lot to say about um, Christian community, and because he lived it, he lived Christian community, he developed, he, he was uh, strategic in starting a, a seminary in Germany where um, he and, and many others came together and um, lived together and studied the scriptures together, and uh, he was training pastors and missionaries before uh, he was arrested. Um, but we've gone over uh, life together in sermons before, and uh, he has a lot to say about Christian community. Well, um, what I want to share with you uh, this morning is a few things about Christian community that maybe we take for granted, but it's good to be reminded of these things. And um, one thing is, is that Christian community involves genuine affection. Uh, that there is no uh, facade or fakeness in true Christian community, but it's built out of a, a deep affection and love for one another. Take, for instance, what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, verse 1, and Paul is writing to his good friend and under, understudy, Timothy. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, and notice how he refers to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So he refers to Timothy as his beloved child. Now, Paul was not biologically related to Timothy. Timothy's father was thought to have been a, a pagan, 
and his mother and grandmother uh, were converts to the Christian faith, and they raised Timothy in a Christian household. They taught him the scriptures, and they invested the Christian faith into his life. But somewhere along the way, he met the Apostle Paul, and Paul became a mentor to him, and um, Paul saw Timothy uh, into the ministry, and Timothy was, was a pastor. So um, he refers to him as his beloved child. And I'd like for you to, when you're thinking about Christian community, think about those that have made a powerful impact in your life, those that have um, invested the Christian faith in your life, those that took time to teach you right from wrong, those that took time to attend worship services with you or to study the Bible with you or to pray with you. One of my mentors who's newly retired, uh, Dr. Daryl Donovan, he was a longtime pastor at uh, Sanibel Community Church in Sanibel Island, Florida. And some of you even have gone to meet him uh, when you've gone on vacation, you were down in Sanibel. Uh, Daryl was uh, our pastor in uh, Southwest Missouri, in Nevada, Missouri, where I was born and raised. He was um, pastor there at the First Christian Church uh, for a couple of stints. He, he was there for a few years, then left um, because he experienced some burnout. And then he came back and uh, served at the same church for um, uh, a few more years. And Daryl and I had a great relationship. And I remember him saying to me, um, he said, David, it's important to tell people that that to pray that you're going to pray for them, but it's even more important and more effective to pray with them. And so, uh, praying with someone who has prayed with you, who has um, said, "Let's take this to the Lord in prayer right now." Uh, that's a very intimate exercise when you pray with someone, and it certainly is a basis for Christian community. Well. Um, Second Timothy one one uh, says that, but then uh, you also have First Peter one twenty two. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. So love springs out of a genuine affection for another person, uh, whether that be someone older than you whether that be someone the same age as you, whether that be someone younger than you. Maybe it's uh, toward a father, maybe it's toward a mother, maybe it's toward a spouse, or maybe it's toward a child. Um, but genuine affection, genuine love is born out of the heart. Um, and so um, it is not just um, a superficial, it is not a superficial feeling, but it's born out of a genuine concern for one another. So Christian community involves genuine affection, but also Christian community involves um, praying for one another. And so um, in verse three here, of uh, it says here in 2 Timothy 1 verse 3, I thank God whom I serve as did my ancestors with a clear conscience as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. So one of the things that made Paul's relationship with Timothy so incredibly valuable, so incredibly uh, strong is that they prayed for one another. I'm sure that Paul enlisted the prayers of Timothy and certainly Paul prayed for Timothy as he was facing challenges in the church, as he was trying to keep the church together, trying to pay attention to what was being taught, uh, trying to evangelize um, in a pagan um, uh, Hellenistic uh, 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 Asia Minor. Prayer was something that was absolutely important uh, for their sense of community, for their sense of relationship, Paul to Timothy and Timothy to Paul. And um, notice that it's no mistake that the Lord's Prayer begins with a sense of community. Notice that the Lord's Prayer doesn't, Jesus didn't say, pray then in this way, 
my Father, which art in heaven. But what does he say? He says, pray then in this way, our Father, which art in heaven. And so prayer is not to be um, a selfish exercise, though it's, it's, it's good, right, and, and true to pray for your own needs and to take your own needs to God. But um, prayer is a community exercise, and it's something that we do uh, together. I pray for you, and you pray for me. Uh, so um, I think one of the things that's happening is um, people are relying on the Lord more. People are, are uh, knowing the value of prayer and bearing one another's burdens. So this is important. And Jesus, this was the original intention of the Lord's Prayer, as Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven. So God is shared among you, among me, um, Central Schwenkfelder Church, Christ United Methodist Church, Faith Church at Worcester. We're all serving the same Lord and the same God. Also, uh, Christian community involves shared experiences, shared experiences. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 4, As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Now, there was something about Paul's relationship with Timothy that he remembered his tears. Uh, maybe it was when they had to say goodbye to one another. Maybe it was over a difficult situation in the life of the church that Timothy was pastoring. Maybe it was the loss of a loved one. Uh, later on in the same letter, he mentions um, his, uh, his mother and his grandmother. Um, Paul mentions Timothy's mother and grandmother as being very important in, in rearing Timothy in the, in the Christian faith. And so maybe it was on the occasion of, of uh, one of their passing uh, that, that Paul uh, is saying, I remember uh, your tears. But some of you have had shared experiences with others. Um, maybe you've had a special Christian friend that has uh, ministered to you in a difficult time in your life when you lost a loved one. Um, maybe you um, experienced a, a difficult diagnosis, and so you had a Christian friend that was right there by your side to help you through that. Um, so um, Christian community involves shared experiences. Paul would say in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, that we are to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And so it is, it's, it's one thing, you know, if I was to tell you, if you're going through something very challenging, and if I say, oh, I know how you feel, but I have never been through anything remotely similar. Those words are empty. But if you know from my life that I have gone through something similar and I share those words, then you say, yeah, we can bear this burden together. Or you would be more open to talking with me about what you're going through. But we are to rejoice with those who rejoice. We are to weep with those who weep. So when you hear good news from your neighbor, uh, and if you were to share in that good news, hey, that's great. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, I've been praying for you about that. And it's, and it's good to, to, to let a person know that um, you share in their victory or in their blessing. Or uh, to weep with those who weep. My parents said that there was a practice um, in their hometown that um, when someone passed away, the, the undertaker would bring the body and uh, place the body in the living room and, and the body would lie in state and the visitation would take place in the home. And it might take place over a day or two, but neighbors would come by, would express their sympathies. They might bring food. Um, the, the pastor would come and visit, but this would be over a matter of maybe a day or two 
uh, and the visitation, what we would call a visitation or a wake, would happen in the home. And this would be, of course, before the funeral. Um, but the, the grief was a shared experience. Psalm 42 verse 4 says, These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. So the writer here of Psalm 42, not sure if it's David or who it is at this particular point, but he is saying he remembers uh, the shared experience of going to um, the Lord's house together. Um, and this, uh, this may have been the temple, this may have been the tabernacle, uh, but going to uh, the place of worship together and sharing in that with fellow believers, with God's people. And um, there is something to that. You know, church has been taken from us as we have known it. Uh, the experience of gathering in that sanctuary that we love and sitting in that pew that you're used to or in that cushioned chair, um, depending on what service you go to, or sharing a cup of coffee with someone that you love during the social time in between the services. That's been taken from us. But um, we recall those times fondly. We miss those times, and we look forward to those times in uh, the days ahead, hopefully uh, in the next month or two. Uh, also, I would share with you that Christian community involves faith and encouragement. Faith and encouragement. 2 Timothy 1.5, I am reminded of your sincere faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and with your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And so what's beautiful about the Christian community is, is that it has a common goal. Um, our growth, our maturity, our stature, our development in dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ and a relationship with him that, you know, begins in the here and now and lasts through eternity. So that's uh, what it's about. And um, it's a communal experience. It's an individual experience, but it all centers around a uh, faith relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So maybe I want to transition to the discussion questions before we watch a little video. Uh, let, let, me, let me just ask you, and, and why don't we do this? Consider the first question, and not everybody talk at once, or we're, it's going to be pretty garbled, but... Um, why, why, don't, why don't you raise your hand if you'd like to uh, add, and, 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 and we'll call on you. Um, so let's consider the first question. What do you think you have missed the most over the past five weeks? What have you missed the most about your former life? Well, I miss this being together with everybody at church. I mean, I, you know, I had a lonely existence before I moved up here, but it's almost as lonely even though there are people all around me. I miss being with people, and I especially miss my people from church. Well, I certainly miss structured physical therapy and the hope of getting back into the pool and doing laps. And, and that, that involves other people. Uh, that involves, you know, touch and, you know, engagement. Yeah, Drake, I, I appreciate that. You know, you, you've, you've moved from Paoli, and this, you know, this bomb went off, and and uh, yeah, you're surrounded by people, but there's not much community taking place uh, uh, there in the traditional sense, is there? No. The, ca the cafe has closed, and I think from from my perspective, obviously everyone has a different perspective. But uh, I have family and medical, so my son's on the ER, so he's on the front line <clears throat> with the COVIDs. Um, so we can't interact with him. Um, I do get to see my granddaughter. We literally. Uh, pass her off in the garage, believe it or not. I saw her a couple hours yesterday, so that was a blessing. But they can't come up here because of my parents. 
Um, so I have to be very careful. I have elderly people living here. So my parents, so it's, it's a different life. We can't get together. We can't have dinners. We can't uh, do that kind of thing. So miss yeah. that a lot. And I know that there are others of you in, in this meeting that you, you, you set aside Sunday evening for a, a family get together. And, um, and now maybe you're not able to do that. That's, that's hard. That's yep. hard. Anyone else? What have you missed the most? David, I miss spontaneity. I miss the family, of course, and friends, but the spontaneity that life can give you every day. You can make it your own day. And now I feel like it's pre-planned and structured and can't go here and can't do that. So I miss the freedom of that. Wow, that's good, yeah. Your, fr your freedoms have been taken away, yeah. Anyone else want to share? Did I miss having an excuse for not doing my work around the house? <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Anyone else want to share? Yeah, I don't know. Actually, what we miss the most is also tied to one of the blessings, I guess. Um, so I, maybe this is a transition to the next question. But we've dad has come to live with us. And that's been a good thing. We whisked him out of the nursing home just in time for this, or actually because of this whole situation, and, and brought him home to be with us. But because of that, we're being very careful not to interact with our kids and grandkids because of the exposure and the potential for that. So we're kind of mixed, and here comes Dad back to the picture. So uh, mixed, mixed blessings, I guess. We, we do keep up with the kids and grandkids on on uh, WhatsApp and Marco Polo and all those <laughs> clever things, I guess. They yeah. kind of drive me nuts sometimes, but... Uh. And, and those of you who, who might uh, not know what those are, those are apps that uh, allow for you to record video and, and send it to your loved ones. They're, if you can think about, um, instead of sending a text message, you're sending a short video. Oh yeah, I was just gonna gonna say that uh, up until fairly recently, Ollie and I were able pretty much every day to walk from our new home here at Meadowood over to the church and walk around the loop around the church, the the cemetery, and uh, we we enjoyed that. But I must say that uh, it's an incredible feeling walking around there and there's no one around. Um, the doors are locked, there's signs on the doors. And it kind of reminded me, I just thought of this, that, uh, you know, we're obviously not persecuted Christians, but, but for the first time we're told that I can, I mean, certainly in my life, you're not allowed to go to church. Yeah. And that is just such a, a, a different world for us. Now, the good news is we get together virtually and, and, and it's, 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 it's great news, but just walking around the church with no cars, no people, very few cars on, on, uh, 363. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a pretty incredible feeling. Very strange. Yeah. I, I miss interacting with our senior pastor. How, how'd I, how'd I do that? <laughs> on a more serious note. I miss you too. I guess the one thing I would like to point out is, you know, you try to stay normal and I'll, I'll give you a little pitch. Um, the renovation committee is, is still working. We haven't lost our uh, impetus. We've been having virtual meetings. We've had two or three since this has started. Uh, we're still doing stuff ourselves outside of that. So, I mean, we're trying to maintain somewhat of a degree of normalcy in, in the church life even though we have certain restrictions that we have to adhere to. Wow. We appreciate that. Well, let, let's, um, I, I don't want to leave anybody out. One um, thing I was going to mention is that what I miss is some of the activities. I'm talking about the opportunities to be doing outreach or ministry. Like for example, some of the things I did at uh, um, Doc Woods. But flipping it into another aspect, and this is more into your second question, well, one thing, one door closes, another door opens. Mm -hmm. And we should not use uh, or think that, okay, it's gone because there's a whole range of activities we can do to keep on doing the, the mission of outreach. 
That, that's an excellent point, Bill. Um, that, that's a good point, and, and that does lead to uh, our second question. When one door closes, another door opens. Um, what has been good about the containment? Bill mentioned opportunity for different type of ministry. What's been good? Vernon, you said uh, an opportunity for your dad, Fred, to come and live with you. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's for sure. I and mean, we've had obviously some much more time together in the last five weeks than we would have otherwise. And, and uh, I'm, I'm so grateful that we made the decision to bring him home because uh, the circumstances locked in the in the nursing home all this time would not have been good for him or us to be yeah. totally separated that way. Um, I just wanted to say that this has been an opportunity. It's It's been a motivator to pick up the phone and call faraway friends. Many of my family and friends are scattered around the country. Yesterday I spoke with my my best my my maid of honor in our wedding and who lives in Colorado now and just to reach out to them and see how they're doing it's just been it's been good to have those conversations I have a list of people that I'm still going to be headed for in the next few days so it's just been a good time for that yeah I, I was going to say that I've uh, experienced this isolation once before in my life as, as a seven-year-old I had the scarlet fever in those days, that was a very uh, contagious disease, and because my dad was uh, producing milk, uh, my mother was isolated with me on the second floor of the house. She never left the second floor. She was up there with me. My sister Elaine did the cooking and passed the meals up the stairway to my mother, but she never left me on that second floor and no one else ever came up to visit me where i was on the second floor uh, for how long this went on for 30 days wow. Uh, it, wow. you know, a, little, a little scary of course on a seven-year-old's part but uh, you soon soon got used to things and uh, but it, like i said this uh, isolation is not uh, not new to me at all <laughs> Absolutely. It teaches you uh, what, what's really valuable in life. Wow. Well, I'm glad that you survived that, Fred. Vernon is too, so. <laughs> what, what has been good about the containment? Well, for me, I certainly no. got to know my mother very well, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I just uh, wanted to say that I think the one thing that is good about the containment, and while we're very sad that we cannot be together in church, and I do miss seeing everyone, I think that uh, this really has forced us to avail ourselves of the technology that we can reach so many other people. And as Bill said, this is great for outreach. Uh, this morning, because we had this video available, I was able to, instead of just telling people in our family how wonderful the messages are at our church, we could actually show them, um, you know, we send the link, but we now have the ability to reach far more people than just those sitting in the pews. And hopefully, people in the community will see uh, what a wonderful church we have and, and the messages, the uplifting uh, messages that we hear every Sunday. So in that sense, I think this is good. This has brought us up to speed. You, you go on the Facebook page and you see really wonderful things there. Uh, so in that respect, I, I think, uh, you know, again, kudos to Jeff and all those who are responsible for doing this. I, I think that is one thing that I see as really a positive. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, here, here's something that goes along with that that I just think is, I, I'm just dumbfounded. Mm -hmm. So the Tenebrae service is um, one of my favorites throughout the year. And, and some of you have said that 
as well. It's, it's unlike any other service that we've done. We have maybe 100, 150 people that come to that service year in and year out. Um, this year, we had to do it virtually. Uh, just take a guess at how many people viewed that service mm -hmm. online. 500. Mm -hmm. Or 600. 300. 600 people. Oh, my gosh. Uh, several that's uh that uh now I, I wish we could uh sardine all those 600 into our sanctuary sometime. <laughs> uh, but hey um, i i would imagine that being online and some people had never heard well, what's t what's a tenebrae service what is that what's that about so yeah right and i think many people go past the church and think oh that looks like a nice church um you know, I wonder well, what they do there. <laughs> now right. they, they, they have the opportunity to know. And so maybe yeah. we'll get more people coming. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Okay. Anyone else want to share before we go on to the uh, final question? Yeah, just, uh, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this last week or not. It's a small thing, but it's as a result of us being here in the house, we've been able to enjoy a pair of Cooper's hawks setting up home out in the tree out in our front yard. They, we first noticed it just about the time that we were all sent home and uh, they would show up occasionally and the next thing we, we found there's a large nest being built in the oak tree out front. So wow. it's, it's it's been kind of a, a reality TV show for us. We can sit here and, and watch them. And, uh... So when we think about uh, what's been good, Tom Rayner put out a, uh, uh, an email. These are the, um, just some observations about uh, being uh, in this time of quarantine. He said, um, um, he said, I'm not making light of the devastating impact of COVID-19 on many lives and, and our economy. But in the midst of the challenges, we are hearing of some of the ways that God is blessing churches. And he shares 10 of them. Uh, number one, two weeks ago, 15% of church leaders thought their churches would close as a consequence of the pandemic. Today, that number is down to 3%. There is indeed much hope. Number two, giving for 78% of churches is either the same uh, at, in, in the pandemic as before, or it's only slightly down. So for 78% of the churches observed, uh, giving is only slightly down or it's the same. Um, and number three, church members for the most part are enthusiastically adopting physical giving. So this is uh, forcing churches to kind of uh, come up with the times. Um, and and uh, to do latest and greatest practices. Um, number four, church leaders are creatively discovering ways to reach and minister to people who are viewing their streaming services. So as this was, uh, as Bill said, it's uh, creating um, more, cre uh, more ways in which we might reach others. Um, here's here's uh, something uh, we can say tongue in cheek because churches can't meet in person. Most congregations are not having business meetings, therefore avoiding conflicts like they've had in the past. <laughs> <laughs> well, our, our, our deacons meetings are, are pretty uh, uh, jovial and um, a good nature, but uh, I can't say, uh, you know, that, 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 that's interesting. Um, number six, church members are adopting video conferencing technology with enthusiasm. It's become a key mechanism for churches uh, post-COVID-19. Um, uh, also, I'll, I'll share this. Pastors are reporting to us their desire to become better preachers. They're seeing areas that they can improve as they watch themselves on video. So, um, yeah. That's, that's good. That's good. Well, what I'd like to do in the closing time that we have is uh, I'd like to share about a 10 minute video and um, um, uh, from Tim Keller, 
on the importance of community. Tim Keller is a pastor of um, a Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City. Uh, they have uh, several sites, um, and uh, they uh, really took off uh, right after 9-11. Um, and um, Tim Keller um, was educated here in Philadelphia, as a matter of fact, but he felt the need to go and plant a church in, in Manhattan, and God has used him in a, in a mighty way. So I'd like to share the screen with you and just share this 10-minute uh, video on the importance of Christian community. So why don't we, uh, why don't we do that now? God's purpose in history is to glorify himself through forging a new humanity, a new community, of people that follow and believe in him. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. The word holy means set apart, distinct, different. And so the idea of a holy nation is God saying, I want you as my people to be distinct and different. I want you to be a new society in which the world can see exhibited what everything in life could be under the kingship of Jesus Christ. We are to be a community that operates on distinctly, sharply different principles when it comes to how we do all things in life. Virtually every aspect of the way in which we live has to be changed by the word of God, by the gospel. And that's what a holy nation is. And yet, Peter also says, we must be a royal priesthood. Priests are mediators. Priests speak to God on behalf of, in the shoes of the people, as it were. Priests bring the needs of the people to God. Priests are also counselors. Uh, they are deeply involved in the lives of people. Not so much to bring God to the people, but to bring the people to God. And we're told here that we're to be an entire kingdom of priests. We're all supposed to, as Christians, be pouring ourselves out in involvement and service to the people around us, so as if possible to bring them to God. So we are a holy nation, different, distinct from the world and the people around us. And yet at the same time, we're supposed to be a royal priesthood, deeply involved in the lives of the world and the people around us. We therefore, like Jesus, need to be distinct from the world for the world. That's the sort of community we're supposed to be. In fact, all the Old Testament language of temple and priesthood and sacrifice is taken in the New Testament and applied in the most startling ways to our lives as believers in community. So, uh, we are not just to go to the house of God one day a week and watch a priest make a sacrifice to bring us near God. We ourselves are the dwelling of God. And we're told we're all priests. Every area of our lives, both vocational and recreational, both civic and family, all areas of our lives are now to be a living sacrifice. That's what we're told. And that means we can't go out into our daily lives in the world uh, with the same attitudes and values of everyone else and then confine our spiritual life to the weekends and the evenings. No, we are called as a community to respond to the glory of God in absolutely every area of our lives. So please, don't overlook the centrality of community. First, you cannot know God apart from community. When we read in the Bible how Jesus made disciples, we see he brought them together. They lived together. They ate together. They had close contact with one another spiritually and socially and, and emotionally. Therefore, the most crucial venue for discipleship, for coming to know and follow Jesus, is communities. For example, fellowship groups and friendships. That's the very best place to take the Word of God and His truth and work it into your life 
through discussion and dialogue and application. When God summons you into a relationship with himself, he also always summons you into a new community of people who also know him. That means you can't just come to church, even every week, and get inspiration and information and not cement yourself into a community. We are to be a new humanity, a new community of people who follow, believe in, and know God. That doesn't mean just showing up for church. That's not being in community. That's just being in a crowd. So let me ask you, right now, are you with other people regularly meeting to talk about knowing God and about becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you learning through those relationships? We will not know God apart from community. Second, you cannot change deeply apart from community. Our character is mainly shaped by the people with whom we eat and play and converse and take counsel. Uh, it's therefore our primary social community that makes us what we are at the deepest level. Jonathan Edwards said that before we have an experience of the grace of God, everything we do is out of self-interest. We need a self-image, we need a sense of self-worth, and we have to ground it in something. So that means we don't do our work for the sake of the work. We don't relate to other people for the sake of the other people. Why? Because we're trying to get our self-image, derive our self-image from them. And that means all of my relationships are really about me. But when the gospel changes me, when it roots me in the love of God, then that changes how I relate to people. I can relate to people for their sakes. I can enjoy them for who they are, not just how they make me feel. The gospel changes all my relationships and see where, where this brings us. Gospel-shaped people are enabled to form deep community, and yet only in deep community can we become gospel-shaped people. And that means if you want the gospel to change you, you have got to share life together. You've got to talk together, eat together. You've got to confess your sins to one another. You have to hold one another accountable. You have to make decisions together and consult with each other. You have to learn together. You have to study together until your relationships get to that level, that deep, that supportive, that challenging and committed, they won't be life transforming. It's the one and other passages of the Bible that show us how to build this sort of community. We are to honor one another, Romans 12, 10, serve one another, Galatians 5, 13, offer hospitality to one another, 1 Peter 4, 9, encourage one another, accept one another, bear with one another, admonish one another, teach one another, we're to love one another. That's the sort of community we have to learn to be. So the gospel changes individuals, but only through deep community. It is so possible to have a dramatic, personal, emotional experience about Jesus and not really change in your life because you refuse to give yourself to Christian community. Now third, you cannot win the world apart from community. We often think of community as just the result of the gospel, and it is, but we must not think of community as only the result of preaching the gospel. It is also itself a declaration and a communication of the gospel. It is itself part of the good news. For example, uh, in Christian community, we should show the world how different we regard money, sex, and power. So we do not regard money as mainly a way of getting status, but instead a way of serving people and actually bringing life to people. We do not regard sex mainly as a way of fulfilling ourselves as individuals, but as a way of taking a relationship and turning it into a great community through marriage and family. And we do not look at power as mainly an end in itself, but as a way of sharing and bringing justice to the world. In other words, the gospel turns money, sex, and power into life-giving things. We also have to show how uh, the gospel's power to humble us and affirm us and give us a new identity brings us together with people that otherwise we would never be together with. So in all these ways, Christian community communicates the nature and power of the
gospel. And when the world sees exceptional community, it makes the world more likely to want to be part of it, but it also convinces people of the truth of Jesus' message. In John chapter 17, 23, Jesus says this directly when he prays for us. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Now that's just amazing. Here's Jesus saying that the many way people will believe that he really came and that Christians have found the love of God in him is through the quality of our unity. The quality of our community is the real secret to mission. We will not win the world apart from it. The purpose of Jesus' salvation is to form a new, distinct society that's a sign that Jesus is Lord of the world. You cannot show the world that Jesus is who he is, except through community. You cannot change deeply except through community. You cannot experience God's forgiveness except through community. And that's why community is so absolutely important. We will not know God, change deeply, nor win the world apart from community. Okay. Well, any any comments about that um, video clip? One thing I think was hit me was when he said, "What's the quality of our community? You know, how how well are we connected, and how and the, and the better the more quality we have of our community?" Uh, and and begs the question: How how can we improve the quality of our community? Um, and maybe in some ways this uh, time of containment is allowing us as a church maybe to press the reset button on, on uh, our, our idea of community. I'm just impressed at how many of you showed up this morning uh, to this virtual Sunday school. I'm, I'm very <laughs> blessed. So. I agree that uh, this is a chance to reassess uh, community. Uh, and we appreciate the ways that uh, uh, so many of you have commented on uh, video and video conferencing. Uh, this is this is Plan B, right? Uh, I mean, we're glad to do video, uh, but Plan A is that we're able to share together, be together, um, speak with each other, share a cup of tea with each other. Uh, that's Plan A. Um, in the meantime, uh, we're, not only do we have Sunday school like this, there's prayer meeting at noon on Tuesday, and there's a Wednesday Bible study at noon on Wednesday. And we encourage you for the plan B uh, of community and Bible study or prayer, uh, but it's clearly plan B. Plan A is that we're all together in one building, uh, pulling with each other and for each other. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Well put. Well put. Well, uh, anyone else uh, want to comment before we close in prayer? Uh, yeah, I think uh, Drake was talking about this this morning about, I think it renews all of our, our thoughts and redirects our, our, our energy towards family and friends. And um, it's been a real blessing that way. I also think in it's, when we look here, it again puts the, the idea of community more than just being a particular church or building. I think to uh, the uh, prayer group meeting where we had uh, um, the person from California who joined us. And mm. you see the, the extent of things go beyond just the thing. And this is the case where um, technology and such has been able to bring people together, even though we're in a period of uh, great sorrow and tragedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I think in this unique time that, as Dr. Drake said well, is plan B, it's, it's an opportunity for us to utilize the more time we have to be in the Word, to commune with the Lord. And the more we do that, I think like Pastor Tim Keller was saying, the more we see God's design to be of community with one another. Um, so I think like a healthy culture from what I'm hearing and what we're seeing biblically is of communities built out for, from us seeing our own need 
So hopefully, I, I think I'm learning from this, like telling myself, James, continue to commune with the Lord. And as I do that more and more, I will want to seek community with one another, whether that's during COVID-19 and virtually, or even more so, Lord willing, when the time comes, flesh and flesh, you know, with people. Um, so, yeah, the community with the Lord being the, the door that is helping us see our community with one another and how he uses one another to help us want him more. Yes, Chris. Oh, yes. Um, for me, uh, this has been extremely emotional, and I want to just thank David and Drake. This is uh, um, coming up on the fifth anniversary of losing Larry and seeing old friends, and uh, it just has meant, meant the world to me this morning. So thank you for that. Mm. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Well, why don't we, uh, why don't I close us in prayer? Thank you for your time. And I hope that you'll join us again next Sunday. Um, so uh, let me, let me go to God in prayer and, and let me pray for you all as well. Let's pray. Gracious God in heaven, we thank you for this time and your word and time talking about community, and we pray that you would bless each one here, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity to connect and to grow, and uh, Lord, uh, to see one another, uh, finally. Um, although it's through a computer screen, it's uh, been wonderful to be able to connect with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, we pray that you would take this type of ministry and continue to use it for your glory. Lord, we thank you for what's been shared this morning. Uh, uh, we thank you for uh, the words, and uh, we thank you for the video clip from Tim Keller, and, and just what's, um, what we have spoken today of uh, the, the silver linings in, in all of this, God, uh, to know that you are at work and you are um, making it um, uh, for the good. Um, and we, we praise you for that. And Lord, we pray for all the unspoken needs that are in this, uh, in this meeting to this morning, Lord, um, different ones that are dealing with different things. We, we pray that you would encourage us, strengthen us, help us to lean and depend upon you. Lord, we thank you and praise you for who you are. And we give you all the praise in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Have a good one. Be safe.